So, hey, I think I'm live. Not sure. Let's take a look. Oh, I am. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, here's a here's the thing. We're going to do this thing. We're going to try it anyway. Uh, every day, every weekday at around 3 o'clock, we're going to try this thing called Afternoon Ask Anything. And it's going to be exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you just... You know, ask anything. And it'll run, I don't know, like a half hour or so, and then we'll convert it um, as fast as we can into a podcast that'll be available for your drive home from work, at least whenever you start driving to work again. Um, so this is just a test run. That's all this is. I'm going to do this today and tomorrow just to make sure that I've got the technical components down. Uh, the simplest way, the easiest way to get a question in is to, you know, just shoot it. And it can be about anything at all here. Um, I'm looking here to make sure that it's on everywhere that I need it to be on. It appears that it is. I'm looking at Facebook. It's there. Twitter is there. YouTube is there. Oh, and here come a whole bunch of questions. All right, we're ready to do these then. And when you ask a question, I will take it and and you will see it display across the screen the same way we have Ben's there right now. Ben starts off by asking, what's your favorite baseball movie? Um, honestly, I know there's there's some that are, that are real staples uh, for everyone. Um, I would say, and this is really boring and drab, that it's the Ken Burns documentaries because they bring back that time from baseball that you just otherwise can't capture. Uh, the honest, genuine footage. Um, we ran into uh, some video not that long ago of Hannes Wagner doing a, an interview, like on video, and it was amazing. It was like this guy that you'd only ever seen on the statue and seen these still photos of, and there he is speaking like he was a real person. So that's my answer. To that one here. Mike Hamilton asks, any guesses to how long Gino will be out? Guesses would be unfair. It's whatever it is. It's a medical thing. Uh, but I'll tell you what, Mike, when I watched him come back out for that shift after he went down the tunnel and then returned, I thought to myself, someone from the Penguins medical staff cleared him to go back out. If it's something that's major or serious, that doesn't happen. It just doesn't. It's just not something that that uh, that would occur here. Man, they're they're flying in here. You guys are like easy. <laughs> I thought this was gonna be like pulling teeth. Uh, David Kimmelman asks, in your opinion, is Kibrian Hayes the best position prospect since Kutch? I have a fun answer for that first, David, and that is that he might not be the best position prospect the Pirates currently have. And I say this in part because Nick Gonzalez lashed that opposite field double yesterday in Bradenton, RBI double, and uh, had another hit as well. And he is quite the talent. And MLB Pipeline with Jonathan Mayo, the inestimable, reputable Jonathan Mayo, who actually lives in Pittsburgh, ranks... Gonzalez ahead of Hayes on the prospect list. Now, you're not going to see that for very long because Hayes is about to come off those lists because he's going to be playing in Pittsburgh. But that's still something. So Gonzalez is the answer. The, the, the straight answer to your question is yes. Yes, he is the best position prospect since Kutch. Lee wants to know what's in the mug. This is a completely healthy, this is a completely healthy iced coffee that I have made uh, that actually my wife, Dolly, constructed with uh, all artificial everything. It's so good. Um, white chocolate syrup from right over here in the Strip District where our studio is. If you want to contribute to this thing, you can do so just by jumping onto Facebook, jumping onto Twitter. Uh, we also take YouTube comments off of our, our YouTube channel. Who you got in the tournament this year is the next question. I have not the earth, earthly, earthliest. I was about to say I haven't had enough coffee yet. I haven't got the faintest clue. 
I have no idea. I do know that Kentucky and Duke didn't even get in. So it used to be easy to just say, oh, I'll take Kentucky or I'll take Duke. Uh, Rob Allman, staff illustrator at DK Pittsburgh Sports, jumps in and says, I must know, is that a genuine Pirates turn back the clock jersey? What was wrong hand? Uh, yes, that's from 1999. For anybody who doesn't know, the Pirates wore these gruesome things for one game at Three Rivers Stadium. It was Chris Benson pitching that day. Don't ask how I remember that. Um, they mercifully were never seen again. And I'm really, really glad that was noticed right away in our fabulous new studio. Uh, Dan Lavoie asks, uh, what are three things that you're currently excited about as it relates to the Pirates? Well, one is obvious. I mean, and, and it's a lazy answer, and that's Hayes. Um, Hayes is going to be fun to watch every game that he plays, partly because of defense. You know he's going to be involved. Uh, baseball itself has become boring. It's home runs and strikeouts and home runs and strikeouts. But Hayes is the kind of player that if and when baseball starts managing uh, a lot of these shortcomings out of the game, and if you've been reading the stuff that uh, Rob Manfred has been rightly proposing to the owners and to the players about rule changes, eliminating the shift and so forth. They want to get some of the action back in baseball. They want the ball back in play. Key is a dream for that scenario. However impactful he is for the Pirates now, he'll be 10 times that once you have these new rules in play. And I believe that they will be in play because they affect TV ratings. Uh, other thing I'm excited about related to the Pirates, uh, I would say the, re the resumption of the careers, plural, of Brian Reynolds and Kevin Newman. I believe that they're both much closer to being the players that they were in 2019 than what we saw in 2020. Uh, I think that's going to be fun to watch over the course of a full summer. And is it fair to say that you're excited about seeing Mitch Keller when he's given up 5 billion runs? It's actually 12 in five innings of ball and spring training? Yes, because he has the capability. It's going to be fascinating in one direction or the other. He was not that long ago the number seven prospect in all of baseball, Dan. Uh, there's no reason for us as observers to lower the bar on what that kid can do. Let's see what else we got here. <laughs> Daniel Green asks, how did the Flyers recover from last night? They lost nine to nothing uh, to the Rangers. Uh, easy answer. I don't care. I don't care. Actually, I mean, they'd have to go get a goalie. There's really, really nothing else to it. Uh, Eric asks, do you think the Penguins will make any trade of significance? Do Burke and Hextall believe in them? I assume you mean believe in the Penguins as opposed to believe in trades. Uh, but actually, you could ask that question either way because they'd have to really, really, really believe in this group in order to believe in giving up anything significant toward this franchise's future, to, to commit anything to this team, like something along the lines of a draft pick or a prospect, not that they have prospects to give up, or a good young player like Marcus Pedersen, you had better believe that this team has a chance to win this cup this year. I can't Imagine that in watching this group that they would feel that way. Yes, they're getting results. Yes, they continue to get results. Yes, they are 8-4 and four combined against the two teams over them in the division, Capitals and Islanders. But there's still something about the eyes and the heart that have to sell you on the idea that this team has another gear and that it's capable of of hitting that gear. I don't see that. What I do see, though, is that they have to go out and get some centers. They know and we don't how long Teddy Bluger is going to be out. They know and we don't, presumably, how long Evgeny Malkin is going to be out. Uh, you got to get yourself some center help. You can't have Mark Jankowski on your second line. George asks, if you ever envision a change in NHL injury reports to match those of the other pro leagues, could gambling impact the need for more disclosure? Yes, George, it'll take gambling. It really will, because that's what happened uh, in the NFL. 
And the more you see sports betting get legalized, not just here in Pennsylvania, though that's happened, uh, but across the country, the more money that you see going into this industry, the more you're going to see an enforcement of regulation uh, and pressure, pressure on the NHL to stop with this silliness about lower body, upper body. And sometimes they don't even do that. I think there's a misnomer that that coaches are required to say upper body or lower body. Some of them just don't say anything. That happened with the Devils not that long ago, where they just said so-and-so's just out. He's hurt. Uh, they're also dishonest. John Marino was said by Mike Sullivan about a week and a half ago to be having a maintenance day. The term maintenance day is supposed to mean that there's nothing wrong with the player. We're just giving him a breather. Well, there clearly was something wrong because the very next day Marino was listed as out because of an injury. He didn't get that injury between maintenance day and the next day. He's still not out. So that's the kind of stuff that's going to have to go away. I mean, I'm not I'm not picking on Sullivan. I'm sure all coaches do it. I'm just giving you an example that's fresh in my head here. Nebs asks, Dan, give me the percentage chance that Pittsburgh retains Juju, in your opinion. Well, I think the percentage is higher today than it was yesterday, and I think it's higher – it was higher yesterday than it was the day before because you're seeing wide receivers not really getting a whole lot of money or not getting a whole lot of offers. That doesn't surprise me. When you see draft after draft after draft is producing tons of wide receivers, last year's class was supposed to be 10 deep in elite potential wide receivers, and Claypool was the 11th. Chase Claypool was the 11th. So you could argue very easily that it was 11 or more deep. When you have that much of an influx of talent into the league at a given position, hey, supply and demand. If receivers are available everywhere, why would you overpay for one who was, I'll say it, Pittsburgh's third best wide receiver in 2020? That's not a shot at him. It's got nothing to do with his social media. He just was. Bill Jones asks, do you think Brian Hayes is the real deal and will Reynolds, Brian Reynolds have a bounce back here? Um, there's no question in my mind about what Hayes is. Now, if you want to quantify the real deal as being, is he going to hit like Ted Williams every month for the rest of his life the way he did as a rookie? The answer is obviously no. Everyone has to understand and accept that there's going to be regression from his hitting nearly 400 last year with power and immaculate defense and everything else. But can he be a star in this league? Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. He just does everything. And he does, he has skills that are repeatable skills. Reynolds will have a bounce back year, but I am skeptical that he'll bounce back to his 2019 level. I believe that pitchers have caught on to the fact that he really, really hates off speed pitches. And he's going to have to do a good job of working them into fastball counts to mitigate that. Uh, that's a double challenge from what he faced in 2019. So I think Reynolds can get back to being a good player. He's not going to hit 183 again. Let's do that. TJ asks, if Najee Harris is available at 28, aren't they picking at 24? Yeah, I don't know why you're asking at 28. Uh, do the Steelers take him, or is there too much wear and tear on him already? Well, there's not... There's not going to be as much wear and tear on any college running back as what the Steelers would be getting from a free agent. So if they decide that they're going to take a running back high, and you do have to kind of have that in the back of your head as you go into the process, you might say, listen, there's this tackle or that tackle that we'd love to have in this tackle-rich draft, and we obviously could use tackles uh, in Pittsburgh. But if you want a running back, then you have to kind of commit to that within the first two rounds. If you get a running back in the third round or fourth round, you're getting another Benny Snell. You're getting another Anthony McFarland. And I don't mean to dump on those guys, particularly not McFarland, who's yet to have a real chance in the NFL. But that's not going to do it. That's not going to be your bell cow that you go into 2021 with, with your 39-year-old franchise quarterback. You need to hand off the football to somebody who can run right away, who can break tackles right away, who can make an impact right away. Uh, that's Najee Harris. Najee Harris, 
I think is going to be available in that area. I'm not yet sold on him over Travis ATN and other guys, uh, particularly ATN. But I also would be open to the idea of a tackle because I'm not as married to the whole all in or all out in 2021 just because Ben's there. Um, they built the 2020 team in that way, and you can't do that. You can't just keep doing that forever. Let's see what else we got here. Theodore Belmont says, hi, DK, big fan from Vancouver. Hey, Theodore, I'm a big fan of Vancouver. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Let's see what Vincent's got. I'm very surprised about the big money going to not really big names in NFL free agency. Don't be, Vincent. The teams that spend in the first week are always the ones with the big cap room. People are getting all weirded out about the Patriots in particular. They've spent a, a ton of money. Well, they had a ton of space. Bill Belichick knew he went into this offseason with a ton of space. So he's decided, all right, I'm just going to go ahead and spend it. You know who's going to have a ton of space next year? Yeah. Look at the Steelers' cap space going into 2022. It's the last I saw. Last I saw, the figure was $148 million. Not the payroll. The space. Now, you're going to have to commit a significant chunk of that, and I'm sure that they will, to T.J. Watt, uh, maybe get Minka Fitzpatrick done, do other things like that. But you're still going to have a lot of room. And when that happens, you are one of the early higher bidders. So those are the guys that come off the board right away, even though the cap didn't go up very much at all. If you want to participate in this, by the way, just uh, put something in comments on your Twitter, on your Facebook, and under YouTube. I think this is also streaming on YouTube. Let's see what else we got here. Another Vince says that's a sweet jet sweater behind you. Vince, you have no idea. There's a goals for kids patch. Remember when a long time ago Winnipeg wore those goals for kids patch? Patches for the uh, for the charity. That's how authentic it is. Oh, uh, here comes one from Jonathan Schaefer uh, in Nashville, who produces Ramon Foster's radio show. ATK hey, question: How great is Ramon Foster? Uh, he's special, man. You know that. You get to experience it every day. Um, he is the real deal. You know what's funny, John? I keep getting asked uh, by readers of our website if we can get 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 like a Ramon type for the Penguins or for the Pirates. And I'm like, there aren't Ramon types. I mean, that's not to say that there aren't former Penguins or former Pirates who would do real well in terms of writing columns and everything else that Ramon does for us. But I am saying that there's only one Ramon. You know, Ramon just, he rolled out of bed able to do this. Daniel from Brazil jumps in. Hey, DK, what's up? How's the vaccination process in PA? I am quite curious as a doctor. Uh, Daniel, I'm happy to say that I'm going to be getting my first shot next uh, next Wednesday at Curtis Pharmacy in Washington, PA. Uh, I've got an appointment set up, and then there's a second one. You know how that works sometime after that. Pennsylvania has just crossed the 20% rate of people who have received at least one shot. So we're at about the national average after a slow start. Uh, it might not feel like that to people here in Pittsburgh because in Western Pennsylvania, we've been a little behind and we're still kind of lagging in that regard. But they were really aggressive in Philadelphia, which kind of skews the numbers. Hey, man, we're getting there. And if I wanted to do this show symbolically, I'd do it with both sleeves rolled up. CJ asks, hey, DK, what's your best option for the Pens to get another center and to finally be able to get rid of Mark Jankowski with that? I must pause and raise this mug to a toast. Let me have a sip of it as well. Jankowski is bad at ice hockey. He's also not motivated to play ice hockey. Those are deadly combinations. Uh, I am told from the inside, from the inside, and I'll share this with you. I haven't even put this in writing, that the Penguins are very displeased with Jankowski, and they have made him aware of this. 
and they have also made him aware of his very tenuous status with the team. Now, they did this, I am told, before the Bluger and Malkin injuries. So if Jankowski's out there right now basically living on his second wind, then that makes two forwards currently in the lineup who are doing so if you connect him and Colton Sevier that way because Sevier was put on waivers last week. In other words, get it together, fellas, or you will be out of the National Hockey League. It's as simple as that. Um, I don't trust Jankowski in a bumped-up role. I was disappointed to see that Jared McCann, even though he skated uh, today in Newark, will not be dressing tonight. Not disappointed in him. It's, it's a health thing. I'm just saying disappointed that he's not going to have a chance to be out there. Uh, I think you're going to end up seeing McCann center that second line for however long Gino is out once McCann is back. Let's see what else we got here. I'm scrolling through. These all show up like in a uh, in a nice aligned scroll thing, even though they come from different feeds. Mike Costanzo asks, oh, this is good. DK, Pittsburgh has a lot of players in multiple sports that are hall-worthy. What is keeping Dave Parker, Alexei Kovalev, Tom Barrasso, and others out? Well, I mean, each one is obviously a separate case. Dave Parker... Um, in my estimation, as a Hall voter who never had Parker on his ballot, which I didn't, just didn't have the longevity. Uh, you could make all kinds of arguments in favor of his career. Believe me, at one time, he was among the top two or three players in all of baseball, arguably the best in baseball. That alone gets you serious consideration for the Hall. Um but you also got to have some kind of staying power to you. Once he left Pittsburgh, uh, his career wasn't the same. And I think that we in Pittsburgh think of Parker as a much greater player than his overall body of work suggests. I'm, I'm trying to say this and be respectful because all Hall discussions cross into that line where you sound like you have to say something negative about a great, truly great player. But we in Pittsburgh have a higher value on Parker because we only saw him when he was great. Alexei Kovalev, I mean, he's, just, he's, he's got numbers. He's got flash. He's got everything. Right now, what would be keeping him out is he's not eligible yet. That one's easy. Uh, Tom Barrasso played in an era where your numbers are never going to be your friend. Barrasso also achieved all of his awards all of his NHL awards in his very first year as a rookie, as a 19-year-old in Buffalo, and never again after that. Uh, also, Barrasso made no friends. We talk about how nasty he was with media, but the media doesn't vote for the Hockey Hall of Fame. So we're, people like me aren't the ones keeping him out. Uh, he made no friends like anywhere, and I'm sure that doesn't help him. Let's see what we got here. Names asks, any chance we trade for John Gibson? Oh, my, I, I thought this said Josh Gibson for a second. I thought you were, like, paying tribute to the, <laughs> the former Negro League's great. Uh, trading for John Gibson would require parting with assets that the Penguins do not have. So, no, no. Uh, never mind all the complications of uh, the salary that's involved. Gibson makes a ton of money. And never mind the fact that why would Anaheim let him go? Uh, that just, no. Uh, but that's fun dream stuff, isn't it? By the way, hey, you've got yourself a pretty good goaltender here in Pittsburgh. There's a really good chance, a really good chance that he's the best goaltender in the East Division. Uh, maybe not at this second until he were to outplay Tuka Rask on some sustainable basis. But go through the goaltenders in the rest of the East and – you're going to come back to him. Let's see what else we got here. I don't know how to pronounce that one. Ask, is there any chance the Penguins have inquired about Jack Eichel, or is that too uh, – now, come on. This is, we're, I don't want to get into silly season here. Uh, the Penguins, if they make a trade of any kind, it's going to be a left-handed defenseman for a forward that they could use. Jim Rutherford is not the GM anymore. 
you are not going to see, unless I have totally misread the entirety of Ron Hextall's career and his own statements since he's been in Pittsburgh, he's not giving up high draft picks. He's not sending second rounders out for Patrick Marlowe. The days of the trade deadline being Christmas morning in Pittsburgh are over. I really, really believe that. Oh, and here, this one's for my wife. She's the one who set this thing up. She asks, ask the viewers if they would like the option to join you live rather than sending questions in writing. Yes, you can do that. You can join me live once I learn how to do that. <laughs> this is why we're doing a test today. She's figured all of this stuff out technically, and I haven't just yet. So once we do get going with this, you'll actually be able to join me on this show. You'll actually show up as like a smiling, happy little box over here to the side, and you'll be able to ask the question. So it'll be like a de facto talk show, which will make this even more fun, by the way. Uh, ben chimes in with some wisdom here for us that the Flyers suck. The Flyers actually don't suck. The Flyers have talent, and they even have young talent. What you don't have in Philadelphia is the same thing that you haven't had since Hextall was there as a player for 30 years now, goaltending. And when you don't have goaltending, it throws off your entire team. That is not to let the Flyers off the hook for their hideous, overall hideous performance last night at the Garden. But if you go back to the first quarter of the Penguin season, and I kept saying again and again, the Penguins' mistakes that they're making all over the rink are the result of a lack of faith that their goalie is going to stop the puck. I got a lot of heat for that. And it turned out, I mean, I'm not always right, believe me, but it turned out that this was accurate. Because as soon as you started to see Tristan Jari and then after that, Casey DeSmith started buckling down and making big saves, you started to see some of that swag, some of that confidence come back to the lineup. Uh, anybody who has played or coached hockey at any level knows what I'm talking about. You are as confident and as poised as your goaltender is. It all starts back there. Lenny asks, do you see the Pirates taking Kumar Rocker or Jack Leiter? I can tell you, Lenny, that the Pirates have not made up their minds, uh, and I'm not guessing at that. They're wide open to this. That was something that I heard when I was down in Bradenton, and they should be. Uh, never mind that one or the other or both could get hurt. Never mind that one or the other or both could suffer through some you know, crazy performance drop. But what we're seeing right now in the Vanderbilt rotation, and for those who don't know, they both pitch on the same staff. Two guys who are vying to be the number one overall pick in Major League Baseball's draft this summer. For, for anybody who hasn't seen them, they're both dynamite. They really are. Um, they both bring it in the high 90s. Uh, they both have tremendous off-speed stuff, command, the whole deal. To me, with the untrained eye, I go with Rocker for now just based on that big, sturdy frame. That doesn't mean that big pitchers never get hurt, but there's more uh, there's more strength and durability in what they're doing overall that doesn't just involve the arm and the elbow. And I, I look at Kumar Rocker; he, he looks like a right-handed CC Sabathia to me, you know. And I look at at Lighter, who's, a, who's a kind of a smaller guy, and I just, you know. Uh, don't get me wrong. Whoever gets Jack Leiter is going to be getting one hell of a pitcher. But if I'm the Pirates, I, I'm still I'm still leaning uh, toward Kumar. Let's see what we got here. Scrolling down here. Ryan asks, DK, wouldn't you assume that most of the NFL owners are dismayed by the low salary cap this year, even though it's supposed to be protecting them from the lower revenues last year? No, no. Uh, this is... There, there are fan perceptions about how much teams want to spend, how much owners want to spend. I get into this dialogue a lot as it relates to the Major League Baseball not having a salary cap where people say, well, the Yankees and Dodgers would never go for that. Yes, actually, they would. You know why? Because they would make and pocket 
so much money in a cap system. The moment that Gary Bettman went to the wealthiest owners in the NHL 17 years ago, when the NHL had its great big labor brouhaha, and he showed them Rangers, Maple Leafs, Canadians, Red Wings, the teams that were spending the most, and he showed them how much money they would pocket. They were all like, oh, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, this is all right. Never overestimate how much the owners want to compete. Hmm. Let's see what we got here. Is there a surprise player that you think will make the Pirates roster uh, out of spring training? Uh, surprise? I mean, it's it's not the kind of roster where you would lend yourself toward thinking about sur surprises. I would say if there's a surprise to be had in there, it would be a surprise showing that would lead to a surprise role. And for that, I would point to David Bednar, the kid from Mars, who is going to make the bullpen and is pitching extraordinarily well this spring. Um, almost to the point where you're at least thinking that he could end up somewhere on the back end, back there with Richard Rodriguez and Kyle Crick. Uh, that's a nice surprise. I thought Bednar was going to make the team uh, anyway here, TJ says there will be peace in the Middle East before a salary cap in baseball. That's a quote from Andy Van Slyke, which was a long time ago, and that was before all of the rest of the sports had salary caps. Major League Baseball needs one as well. Paul asks, since the Steelers knew the salary cap was going to be as low as it is, should they not have restructured contracts as many as they could? When The Steelers didn't know it was going to be as low as it is until last week. So I'm not sure what you mean, Paul. If you want to clarify that, you can. You can put it back up there. But, I mean, no one knew about 182.5 until just last week. Mike Costanzo says, this is great. It actually is. Although, I don't know if you're referring to my Santonio Holmes catching the touchdown bobblehead. I have a bunch of these that are over here as part of our neighboring morning Java set. Nick says that the Patrick Marlowe trade was so bad, and it was. Mike asks, what about Eric Stahl, decent depth center? Would you see a fit here in Pittsburgh? I believe that Eric Stahl has now gone 13 or 14 games in Buffalo without a goal. Um, everybody does hit a wall. Eric Stahl is, is getting up there. Um, I would take Eric Stahl in a heartbeat if Buffalo would keep a significant amount of his salary, which I'm, I mean, they're the Sabres, so they do dumb things, so you can get them to do that. But I wouldn't be giving up anything in return, and I'd have a very difficult time on the Pittsburgh end clearing any cap space for him. Take a look at what their cap situation is. This is why I keep saying left-handed defenseman has to go out. Most likely left-handed defenseman to go out, Marcus Pedersen, because you can move his his uh, deal, which is off the top of my head here, I want to say it's between 3 and $4 million. And you bring up Pierre Olivier Joseph, who's obviously an NHL minimum, and you manage the cap. Vince says everyone goes that long without goals in Buffalo this year. Yeah, that's right, but you're not looking to acquire uh, everyone. Brad asks, what do you think is the likelihood that the Steelers select a running back in the first round? I will say that I hope they do. I I'll say that I I've watched now extensive footage of – not just Najee Harris, who everybody talks about, but I'm going to mention his name again. It's Travis Etienne. Uh, I saw things in Etienne's film that impressed me more in different facets than what Harris does. Everyone says Harris is that he's that Steelers type running back because he he goes through people because we're just going to forever attach the running back position in this town to Jerome Bettis, or even going way back to Franco, although Franco, even though he was a big guy, never actually ran through people. He went straight to the sideline. ATN does a lot of different things, and he has game-breaker type speed. We have a couple more minutes. Ryan asks, if you have Ben Charrington truth serum, would he rather win 70 games next year or finish dead last to get another number one pick? Um, are those my only two options? Because 75 doesn't mean anything. What Ben Charrington wants to see, and if you think about this, this makes sense. 
What he wants to see is these players that are in Pittsburgh and the players that are at the lower levels get better because if they get better, that means more to him than having the number one pick next year. Think about it. Your entire organization gets stronger and deeper. That gives him more trade material. That gives him more options for success as they move up the ladder and get to Pittsburgh. This is not, you know, I know everybody likes to look at these things in absolutes. He, Charrington, has sworn to me he does not have a timetable on this. And I and I believe him. If the Pirates were to all of a sudden just get really good, he would not resist that, okay? TJ asks, does Jim Rutherford get another job as an NHL GM? No, I, I don't think so. This, this was a departure that I don't think anybody could overcome regardless of pedigree. You know, I mean, he could have any explanation in the world. Uh, for why he left, but nobody's going to do that, especially not at his age. I hate to get ageist here, but it, it's just it's just the truth, you know. Let's see if we can find one more good football one here before I. Uh, Andrew says, "Is is this where your daily shot segments are going to go on radio?" No, there. Oh, you're asking if this is where I do them? No, I actually do them in this little box in the next room for maximum uh, sound impact, but I'm open to anything here. All right, here's one from Paul. Between the Penguins and Pirates' newer GMs, who will have the bigger and faster impact? Uh, does Omar Khan get Steelers' GM when Colbert retires? I don't know that Omar will get Kevin's job. Um, I have reason to believe that, what I just said. Uh, between the Penguins and Pirates, newer GMs, who will have the bigger and faster impact? Well, it depends on where you're talking about. If you're talking about on the ice in Pittsburgh, you can, you know, the Penguins have done nothing but win since Hextall arrived, and all he's done is add a number 10 defenseman in Mark Friedman. So, yay, impact. But the bigger impact of his, of his actions on the roster, oh, my goodness, that's Charrington by, a, by an absolute mile. And here, Adam comes through with the Steelers question. Do you think that the Steelers really want Alejandro Villanueva back? I've been hearing that, and I think it's a mistake. Well, I, I'm. you've been hearing that from John Clayton, who has not had a good offseason. Okay? I'm trying to find a nice way to say that. Uh, I think the reporting is a mistake. I don't believe that Ali has any chance of being back with the Steelers. Uh, you just now saw Zach Banner get signed. He's going to be the left tackle. He got signed to starter money. For his experience level, Chooks is going to be the right tackle. And I'll say it again, this draft is super deep with tackles. Steve in Austria says, would really like your take on my Pedersen question. Scroll up. <laughs> well, now i got to go find your question. Why not just ask it again? Let's see if I can find it here, Steve, since you challenged me to scroll up your list. How did you know it was a scroll up list anyway? as opposed to a scroll down list. Here you are. Oh, wow. No wonder I missed it. It was five miles long. Steve asks, would Marcus Pedersen benefit from a game or two in the press box, giving Yuso Ricola some game time as well? He really struggles. And since CeCe and Matheson picked it up big time, he seems of concern. Not saying doghouse, just like two games, wakey-wakey, and analyze from afar. No. No. Marcus Pedersen is a really good, really headsy hockey player who needs to be out there. Um, I am going to be stubborn on this one. I am a big believer in Marcus Pedersen. If he doesn't get straightened out in Pittsburgh, he will get straightened out wherever he is traded to. Um, I'm not suggesting that he gets traded, but you have a lot of left-handed defensemen right now in this organization, and you have very little cap space, and you now have some pretty significant need up front. Ron Hextall and Brian Burke have to be looking at trading a left-handed defenseman. That's either Pedersen or Dumoulin, and I think moving Dumoulin is dangerous because if you take Dumoulin out, what are you doing to Chris Letang? And if you throw Chris Letang out of whack, you throw everything out of whack, as we've all seen. I have to end this one today. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I was not expecting hardly anybody to show up. Let's do this. Let's try it again tomorrow at the same time. And then by then, I'll have the opportunity uh, to figure out how to do this whole call thing and maybe bring one or two of you in. 
into the video and we'll have additional fun by that. And then next Monday, we will be like masters of this. All right. Thanks.